Hi everyone, I am back. It's late July, summer of 2020, or also known as the summer of COVID. I have yet to get a haircut. I haven't gotten a haircut since New Year's Eve 2019. Uh, for the longest time in Michigan, I couldn't do so legally. And now that I can do it legally, I can't get something scheduled because demand is so high. So I'm just gonna go with uh, the Canadian hockey player 1980s mullet, if you will. I was a teenager in the 1980s, and this is actually the hairstyle that we chose, believe it or not. We actually decided that this would look cool, so this is what we went with. My aunt is a hairstylist, and I told her, please don't admit to anyone that I came to you and said, I want a bi-level haircut, not a mullet, a bi-level haircut, and could you please perm the back? And some of you probably don't even know what a perm is, but let's just say uh, it wasn't good. Even back then it wasn't good, even though I thought it was cool. I did go with the pink shirt though. Uh, Don Johnson from Miami Vice would be proud of me. And again, you have no idea who I'm talking about, but let's just say that was a popular TV show and he was the coolest guy alive and he wore pink often. So I went with that. So let's call it uh, the classical or retro looked look. Okay, in today's segment, I'm gonna talk about exchange rates and exchange rate fluctuations. It'll probably confuse you and give you a headache, but I'll do my best to explain all of this because it matters and it really matters if you're a supply chain management major and you're going into supply chain management. So before I explain why all this stuff is important and articulate why it matters, I'm just gonna spit out the reasons and it's gonna confuse you, but that's okay for right now. I just want you to understand that this stuff is really, really important. So here I go. If the dollar gets weaker relative to other currencies, that means anything and everything that's American gets cheaper. Do you think that might matter if you're in supply chain management? Okay, so if the dollar gets weaker, just tell yourself in your head, dollar's weaker, that means American stuff's cheaper. If the dollar gets stronger relative to other currencies, everything and anything that's American becomes more expensive. So just think, strong dollar, everything that's American is more expensive. Okay. If American stuff is cheaper or stronger, matters. It matters to everyone, especially for people in supply chain management. Okay. If you're a buyer and you work for an American company and you give business to a supplier and you negotiate the terms and conditions of that contract, such as payment terms, and you actually decide what currency you're going to pay the non-American supplier in, exchange rates and exchange rate fluctuations matter. For example, if you decide to pay the foreign supplier in their currency, which means you have to go to the bank and convert your, your US money to their money, if the dollar gets stronger during that time period of the contract where you decided you were going to pay them in their currency and the dollar got stronger during the lifetime of the contract, you might have just saved your company millions of dollars because you can buy the same amount of material from that supplier with way less money. However, if you decided to pay the foreign supplier in their currency and during the lifetime of the contract, the dollar got weaker, you might have just cost your company millions because now you have to come up with more American money to buy the same amount of material. Or let's say, you went to your chief economist, and large companies actually have chief economists that will tell you, hey buyer, during the lifetime of this contract with this non-American supplier, this is what we think will happen to the US dollar relative to their currency. Therefore, we would advise you to pay in this currency. So you go to the chief economist, and they tell you, I don't know which way it's gonna go. Will the dollar get stronger or will it get weaker? And then you decide, I'm just gonna pay in US currency. One dollar per part, I'll let the Japanese supplier deal with the exchange rate and exchange rate fluctuations. Uh, no risk or reward in that situation, okay? So back to exchange rates and exchange rate fluctuations. I'll get students asking me, well, what is an exchange rate? An exchange rate is simply the value of one currency relative to another. Wherever they intersect, that's what the exchange rate is. What determines exchange rates? Someone will always ask me that. I'm not a finance professor. I barely know this stuff myself. But what I do know is the value of one currency relative to another is what the exchange rate is. So where those two lines intersect, that's what the exchange rate is. The short-term and long-term supply and demand conditions of one currency relative to another is what determines 
the exchange rate. So think about that. The short-term and long-term supply and demand conditions of one currency relative to another is what determines what the exchange rate will be. Then I say that and another student will say, well, what determines the short-term and long-term supply and demand conditions of one currency relative to the short-term and long-term conditions, supply and demand conditions of another currency? And I say, I don't know, but it's everything and anything. So interest rates and monetary policy, taxes and government spending or fiscal policy, consumer spending, unemployment, exports, imports, investment spending, all of that stuff, you mix it all up and it impacts the short-term and long-term supply and demand conditions of one currency relative to that of another currency. When it's all said and done, they intersect at some point, okay? And that's the exchange rate. Now, exchange rates between one currency and another can fluctuate. And sometimes they can fluctuate a lot and they can do so in a relatively short amount of time. Our best friend in a global economy is for currencies not to fluctuate against each other too much, too quickly, or too soon. Because when that happens, that stifles investment and business and commerce between countries and companies from different countries. For example, the European Union is 28, 29 countries. It's basically 28 countries that have decided, economically speaking, they want to be like the United States of America in terms of investment, trade, commerce, and doing business with each other. They just basically want goods and services moving across country lines openly and freely to stimulate the economy. Okay, that makes sense. Of the 28 countries in the European Union, 19 joined the European Monetary Union, where 19 countries said, we're getting rid of our national currency. In other words, we're giving up monetary policy and interest rates and the ability to slow down or speed up our economy by, based on monetary policy and having our own currency. So 19 countries said, we're gonna join the European Monetary Union and we're going to use the Euro. The symbol for the Euro, just in case you've never seen it, is simply this. That's the euro, okay? So that's the currency that belongs to 19 of the 28 countries in the European Union, and that's called the European Monetary Union. And what they decided was simply having 28 countries in the European Union where you do business with each other openly and freely across country lines wasn't enough to stimulate economic activity, trade, commerce, and business. So they decided, hey, let's adopt our own currency because we got a lot of small to medium-sized firms that weren't doing business outside of their home countries and market because of exchange rate fluctuations. And if they fluctuate in a certain direction very quickly, it could bite them in the butt to the point where it puts them out of business. So they created the European Union and within that they created the European Monetary Union. And the idea is that with one currency, you got more small to medium sized and large companies doing business outside of their home market and country and with each other across several different countries. So again, trying to kind of simulate what we have in the United States. The United States is a country of 50 states where basically across state lines you do business openly and freely. We have a single currency so that each state doesn't have to worry about exchange rate fluctuations. Okay, so having said that, I feel like I don't want to talk more about exchange rates and exchange rate fluctuations and what causes them, but I will say this, the last thing you want is for the currencies of the industrialized countries. Remember, they're only like 40 industrialized countries on the planet. There are over 200 countries on the planet. Most of the global economy revolves around these 30 to 40 countries. Uh, 15% of the population, which is the industrialized world, accounts for 85% of all of Earth's economic activity and output. So the last thing you want is for the currencies of industrialized nations to fluctuate against each other in large amounts and rather randomly and quickly because that will stifle trade, commerce, and investment between countries. And that's the last thing you want since so much of the global economy revolves uh, around industrialized nations. I mean, we don't want any currencies really in general to fluctuate like crazy against other currencies, but sometimes with underdeveloped countries and developing countries, you expect 
some fluctuations and you expect the fluctuations to be significant and rather quickly and be up and down where, yeah, if you do business in these markets, there might be some risks, but hopefully those risks don't exist when industrialized countries are doing business with other industrialized nations. All right. So soak that in for just a second. I'm going to pause here and get ready for actually explaining what happens to our economy and what you're majoring in when these exchange rate fluctuations actually occur. Okay, I am back. Let me start by giving you an example. If I say the dollar has gotten stronger, the dollar has gone up in value, the dollar has appreciated, all that means is the dollar's gotten stronger relative to another currency. So that other currency has obviously gotten weaker relative to the dollar if the dollar's gotten stronger relative to it. So again, I know you're thinking, wow, I just got a headache and I'm all confused. And I, and I get it. Uh, it confuses me. That's why I'm going to be pausing probably a few times here just so I can gather my thoughts uh, if I stumble. But let's say the dollar's gone up in value relative to the yen. The yen is the national currency of Japan. Japan is the third largest economy on the planet. The largest economy on the planet by far and away is the United States. And the U.S. uses the greenback or the U.S. dollar as its national currency. The second largest economy in the world is China. And China uses the yuan or the RMB, kind of the same thing. You can reference Chinese national currency as the RMB, RMB, or the yuan, spelled U. A Y U A N. That's the second largest economy on the planet, followed by Japan that uses the yen. Now, both China and Japan will manipulate its currency um, to make it weaker relative to the dollar so that everything that's Chinese and Japanese is cheaper than anything and everything that's American. Why? That means we'll buy more of their stuff. Is that important? Yeah, the United States is a huge market for Chinese and Japanese exports. So if their economy slows down or if they need to export their way out of a recession like Japan's been trying to do, they might mess with their currency to get a cost advantage. In other words, make their currency weaker relative to the dollar so that everything and anything that's Chinese and Japanese is cheaper relative to anything and everything that's American. Okay. The United States in general will not mess with its currency for the purpose of making stuff that's American cheaper or to help the U.S. economy out. We kind of tell American companies, say, whatever exchange rates are, deal with it. And if other countries get a cost advantage because of exchange rate fluctuations, then work your way through it. Figure out other ways to do things better, faster, and cheaper. I will say... <coughs> China does not allow its currency to float freely on the open market. They have it pegged against the U.S. dollar. Okay, What that means is if China's national currency, the yuan or the RMB, was allowed to float freely on the open market, based on supply and demand conditions, their currency should be about 30% stronger relative to the U.S. dollar. So soak that in just for a second. China pegs its currency which I think is an unfair trade practice, to the U.S. dollar. In other words, its currency and its value relative to the U.S. dollar is not based on short-term and long-term supply and demand conditions. Okay, It is artificial in that if China's currency was allowed to float freely on the open market, it would be 30% stronger relative to the dollar. So anything and everything that's Chinese would be 30% more expensive. Now, what would happen to China's economy and its exports to the United States if everything and anything that was Chinese was 30% more expensive? It would be devastating. It would be devastating to China and also probably to the United States because if you have the second largest economy on the planet get hit hard, because everything and anything that's Chinese is 30% more expensive, that's probably gonna actually be bad for the United States. It's just unfortunate that they get a 30% cost advantage that has nothing to do with actually doing things better, faster, and cheaper. I think that's unfair to the American economy, if you will, but that's just my own uh, personal take. Something else I wanted to point out is uh, you can buy and sell currency. If you can predict this stuff, you could literally be a billionaire tomorrow. There are people called hedgers or hedge fund managers that do this for a living. And sometimes they will make a billion dollars one day 
but the next day they might lose a billion dollars. How do you know what the short-term and long-term supply and demand conditions will be of one currency relative to another if so much goes into it that not even the most powerful person in the world can rig the system or get insider information where they can make these calls. So you've noticed, I've noticed, and I've read that people that buy and sell currency, and the only rule of buying and selling currency is that you have to do them in pairs. So if you wanna buy a Japanese yen, you have to sell something to get it, like the US dollar. Like you can't just say I'm gonna buy Japanese yen without having currency of another nation. It's like you have to buy and sell currency in pairs. Uh, if you wanna buy Apple stock, you can just buy Apple stock. You don't have to sell something to buy Apple stock, or if you buy Apple stock, you're not required to buy stock in another company. When it comes to buying and selling national currencies, you have to do that in pairs, but you can do that 24 seven and exchange rates fluctuate 24 seven if they're allowed to uh, float freely and openly uh, on the market as most currencies are, but China is an exception. They peg their currency relative uh, to the US dollar. Okay, so uh, let's get started. If you hear the US dollar is getting stronger relative to the yen, that just means that the dollar's gone up in value. It's appreciated. So let's visualize this a little bit. We're using a lot of technology here. See this piece of paper? And I use my uh, five-year-old's marker. So we're going high tech here. Look at the top there. It says $1 equals 100 yen. So let's say yesterday, that was the exchange rate based on supply and demand conditions. That's where the two lines intersect. $1 equals 100 yen. The next day, $1 equals 200 yen. Does it make sense to you that the dollar's gone up in value? That's a, it's appreciated, okay? Yesterday, you went to the bank and you gave them a dollar. They gave you 100 yen back. You're like, okay, cool, I got 100 yen. The next day, you give the bank a dollar and the bank says, wait a second, the dollar's gone up in value. I'm gonna give you 200 yen now because the dollar's stronger. Okay, so if you look at that and you see this on the test, you would know that, oh, the dollar's gone up in value. It's appreciated. It's gotten stronger relative to the yen. Now, if you look at that page, this is why if the dollar gets stronger, anything and everything that's American gets more expensive to anything and everything that's Japanese. Okay, let's say Toyota yesterday, okay, top line there, sold a truck for a dollar. Toyota's a Japanese company. They take that dollar, they go to the bank, and the bank gives them 100 yen back, okay? Let's say the next day, the exchange rate is $1 equals 200 yen. All right, so here's my question. If the dollar's gone from a dollar to 100 yen to a dollar is now worth 200 yen, in other words, it's gone up in value, what could Toyota sell that truck for in America and still get their 100 yen? They could drop the price to 50 cents and get 100 yen. All right, so now you're thinking, what? What are you talking about? Okay, I know, it's complicated. It's hard to visualize, but the point I'm trying to make is, when Toyota sells that truck yesterday for a dollar, the bank's only gonna give them 100 yen when they exchange it for their currency and take it back to Tokyo. The next day, the dollar's gone up in value. They could sell it for a dollar still, and we buy their truck for a dollar. Now they get 200 yen. They've made way more money. But what they're gonna do instead is, they're gonna lower the price so Americans buy more of their stuff because their stuff's cheaper now at 50 cents, and they still get their 100 yen. They still made the profit that they wanted. So again, if you look at that page, what it's basically saying is when the dollar goes up in value relative to another currency, American stuff gets more expensive and the non-American stuff gets cheaper. So what do we do? Look at the GDP formula. We export less, okay, because our stuff's more expensive, and we import more because the non-American stuff is cheaper. So anytime you hear about the US dollar getting stronger, in general, you think, oh no, everything and anything that's American is gonna get more expensive. That means we're gonna buy more non-American stuff. That means non-Americans are gonna buy less American stuff, and that's bad. And it kind of is in general, but if your currency is getting stronger, that kind of implies that there's some decent things going on in your economy, like investors are gravitating towards the US market, for example, which was definitely the case when COVID really hit us right away at first. 
the U.S. dollar got stronger fast and by a lot because non-American investors and American investors were not going to bet against the United States and everyone else they saw as being too risky because of COVID. The dollar has actually dropped 6% in value the last month because things have leveled off a little bit and now Americans and non-Americans are investing their resources in other parts of the world. Now you might think, whoa, a 6% drop in the value of the dollar to an international basket of currencies is a lot in one month and it really is and that's not good for anyone. But it was also at already an inflated rate because so much investment blocked to the United States when COVID hit the global economy real hard because in general people don't bet against the U.S. economy and that's kind of a safe haven when everything else looks really, really risky. Okay, so back to this page, another example would be, let's say GM's in Japan trying to sell a truck. So they're in Japan and they sell a truck for 100 yen and they exchange their money and they get a dollar back. A year later, if they sell it for 100 yen, they're only going to get 50 cents back. So they have to double the price of the truck from 100 to 200 to still get their dollar. So again, what I'm trying to say is if the dollar gets stronger, if anything and everything that's American gets more expensive, we buy more non-American stuff. And then the non-Americans in like Europe and Japan, they buy less of our stuff because our stuff's more expensive. So in general, GDP will go down a little bit if the US dollar gets too strong too fast by large amounts, especially relative to other industrialized nations. Okay? Did that make sense? Boy, I hope it did. Uh, and if not, rewind, go back, think it through, visualize this page, maybe write that stuff down, and at the top right, dollar gets stronger. Everything that's American gets more expensive. Okay? Let's look at just the opposite. Let's say yesterday one dollar equals 200 yen today one dollar equals 100 yen all right if you look at that do you see that the dollar has gone down in value yesterday you went to the bank and the bank would give you 200 yen today you go to the bank and the bank says hey based on exchange rates and exchange rate fluctuations i'm only going to give you 100 yen the dollar has gotten weaker it's depreciated it's gone down in value in this situation toyota would have to raise their prices to get the same amount of yen back. And American companies in Japan could actually lower their prices to get the same amount of yen back. So again, I'm back to, if the dollar is weaker relative to another currency, that means everything and anything that's American gets cheaper. So we export more stuff, more non-Americans buy American stuff. We import less stuff because Americans aren't gonna buy as much non-American stuff because it's more expensive. So. What I try to tell my students is there's a lot to understand and a lot to learn here, but the basics are if the dollar gets stronger, American stuff's more expensive. If the dollar gets weaker, uh, American stuff gets cheaper, and that has an impact on GDP. If you remember the GDP formula, it's consumer spending, that's 75% of our economy, you and me spending our money. Government spending, that's the government uh, building roads, bridges, highways, prisons, hospitals, uh, and sending us checks because it's COVID-19. Investment spending, you take a dollar and you try to turn it into a dollar ten by, say, building a factory and building products and eventually generating a profit, and then exports minus imports. So again, stronger dollar tends to put a dent in our GDP, weaker dollar tends to pick things up. But don't cheer for a weaker dollar unless we're in a recession and we need uh, help. Uh, a stronger dollar, well, it might put a dent in our economy. Chances are the economy is already strong and could afford a little bit of a dent. I think the bigger issues are a trade deficit is bad. It's a negative sign. America's had a trade deficit every year since 1976. Over half of our trade deficit is with China and Japan, and most of our trade deficit is with China. So if you want to say, okay, our trade deficit, which is this part in parentheses right here in the GDP, GDP formula. Our economy is $22 trillion and our trade deficit puts a small dent in our economy. We export so much stuff. Yes, we import more than we export, but we're such an export giant that it puts a small dent in our economy. I don't think we cheer for a weak dollar. Uh, maybe we do just a little bit when times are slowing down a little bit, but we've got other ways of stimulating our economy like lowering interest rates or increasing government spending versus actually trying to manipulate our currency. Again, U.S. policy is we're not going to mess with our currency to give American companies a cost advantage that might stimulate our economy. And again, with China, I think it's an artificial cost advantage 
because they pegged their currency against ours and our government's trying to work with them to loosen that up a little bit and they have but only in very very small amounts so i think we've just gotten to the point where uh, we don't have a lot of leverage there because the second largest economy on the planet and U.S. companies already have a strong footprint in the Chinese economy. So the last thing we need is the Chinese economy to take a nosedive because we said you can't peg your currency against ours. And again, that's not our decision. That's theirs. OK, uh, what else to wrap it up? Oh, yeah. If you're a buyer, again, if you're a buyer for an American company, you might have enough leverage with your supplier if you're bigger and you're also the customer and what if the supplier is a non-american company do you pay in their currency or do you pay in your currency which is assumed to be the u.s greenback and in general if you think the dollar is going to get stronger during the lifetime of the contract you could generate a cost savings by paying in their currency because when you go to the bank to exchange your u.s dollar for their currency you're going to get more of their currency back so you can buy uh, more material with the same amount of money or the same amount of material uh, with less money that's a cost savings so you can look like a rock star and if you have 50 million in spend and you guess that the u.s dollar is going to get stronger and you're paying a japanese supplier in yen you, you know you could generate a two three million dollar cost savings that way but likewise if you decide to pay in u.s dollar in the u.s uh their currency and the dollar gets weaker then that means you're gonna have to come up with more american money to buy the same amount of material your costs have gone gone up a lot of large companies they have chief economists in place that will tell their supply chain organizations when you have contracts and when you look at the purchase order and the terms and conditions and the payment terms we're going to guide you and coach you on the payment terms and tell you what we would recommend you do when it comes to paying them do you pay them in u.s dollar which means you're assuming no risk and also getting no reward with exchange rate fluctuations or because we think the dollar is going to go up in value relative to that currency we would encourage you during the lifetime of the contract to pay in their currency to generate a cost savings for the company. Based on what I've seen, large companies like to roll the dice and play the market like hedgers. And that's risky because even hedgers that are experts in this uh, call it wrong often. It's just risky because so much goes into it. How could you possibly know where the two lines will intersect 24 seven during the lifetime of the contract? You might have an idea, but at the same time, it's so complicated that do you really have an idea? And again, what's implied by doing business with other industrialized nations and suppliers from countries like Japan or in the European Union is the yen and the euro and the dollar don't fluctuate too much against each other to begin with. So what are you really rolling the dice on? Small to medium sized companies that do business with suppliers outside the United States, they don't even like to go there. They just say, I'm going to pay in U.S. money. We're going to agree on a dollar per part. That way there's no risk and I get it, no reward. But the risk is so heavy that if exchange rates go a certain way and I go from paying a dollar per part to actually a dollar 25, this could put me under. So I'm not going there. Most good companies will sit down with suppliers and develop uh, caps or ceilings on the most or least amount of money that will be paid based on exchange rate fluctuations. So in other words, they say basically, let's share and split the risk and the reward so that really it's a wash for both of us. Uh, so that's another way to do it, where you basically say, I don't want to roll the dice. This isn't a casino. We understand that you have your currency and we have ours, and that this is going to impact you at times well. And if it does, let's split the difference. And at times it might impact you negatively. And if it does, let's split the difference. So the right way strategically long term is to share in the risk and the reward. But it depends who you work for, how greedy they are, how big they are. Do they have a chief economist that knows what he or she is talking about? It really all depends. So I hope this has helped. Maybe you have a headache after all of this. Uh, again, I'm not a finance professor. I know just enough so that when I watch the news and I hear about a strong dollar, I know what that means. If I hear a weak dollar, I know what that means. And I also know what it means in the context of supply chain management and my students that are buying things from non-American suppliers. And as far as I'm concerned for now, if you know that, you're way ahead of the curve. Most employers, I've noticed, they actually uh, do not talk about this stuff in a way where you think that they really, really get it. And if you show them that you get it and can have these conversations, uh, I think that will blow them away because uh, they don't expect that from someone that's 21, 22, 23 coming straight out and understanding what the impact of exchange rates and exchange rate fluctuations are on the field that they're going into. All right, that's it from me. Uh, you'll get some material from me on the homework assignment, and I'll take this lecture and put it in the written word.
This one in particular, if you can read what I said, you can slow down, stop, backtrack. This is the one lecture where I think if you actually read it, it'll be easier than uh, if you actually listen to me talk about it, okay? So I will conclude right here. Reach out anytime if I can help you understand all of this a little better. Thank you.